Kendrick, ain't no room for contradiction Fag it, fag it, fag it, we can say it together But only if you let a white girl say nigga Imagine carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders I mean, that'd be impossible, right? Oh wait, do you, do you relate to that? Yeah, I do too. I think at some point in everybody's life, they're taking on a responsibility or going through something that causes them to hold this metaphorical weight of the world on their own shoulders. And you can do it, for a while at least, until it builds up this anger, this bitterness, it eats away at your soul until finally you're just done. I'm just tired of being the one who does the right thing when everyone else doesn't. People look to you, they want you to show them the way, they tell you that they respect you, and then they spit in your face when you can't take it anymore. Stop tap dancing around the conversation. Every time that we hear tap dancing on this disc, it represents Kendrick's biggest flaw. Regardless of whether he sounds like he's opening up, being vulnerable about his grief, showing us his personal growth, He's just avoiding the true problem. All these songs seem to have this productive subject matter that Kendrick is approaching with a good attitude, but they're all projections. They're false reality to cover up his deeper flaws. Mr. Morale and The Big Steppers is a two-part album, an act one and act two, which both tell two distinct stories. Disc one being the stepper side saw Kendrick Lamar trying to be personal, and falling short from true vulnerability. But disc two, well, that's a different story. <laughs> no. <laughs> you texted me at two o'clock in the morning. I feel like I'm fallen. Why do you feel that way? Count Me Out is an earnest opening to the Mr. Morale side of the album, which employs moody guitar chords and ethereal melodies to create this introspective atmosphere Kendrick is going to build on this disc. Verse 1 is written rather spastically. The lyrics are abstract, Kendrick touches on almost every theme he mentioned in the first disc, but this time he approaches it with more honesty, and it seems like he has a desire to relate it back to his own struggle as if he's in a therapy session. I care too much, wanna share too much, in my head too much, I shut down too, I ain't there too much, I'm a complex soul, they layer me up, then broke me down, and morality's dust, I lack in trust. He foreshadows this deep remorse for how he's carried himself throughout his own life, but also the fact that he wouldn't ever be able to do it right if he got another chance. He laments that one of these lives, I'll make it right. Frankly, almost every line on this song is poignantly informative and adds a lot to the lyrical premise of what's going on here, but I think we can sum up exactly where Kendrick is at with just two areas of this song. It seems like, especially now, that the entire implication of the first nine songs was to illustrate Kendrick's tendency to wear a mask and not a physical one. Fortunately, Kendrick makes an effort to show just how much he's learned from these failures through these lines. Mass on the babies, mass on the hot web, mass in the neighborhood, stores you shop, but a mass won't hide who you are inside, look around, the reality's carved in last. There's also an indication of growth and change through the implementation of the tap dancing on this disc. It signifies the opposite of what it was intended to represent in disc one. During songs like Father Time, Rich Spirit, and We Cry Together, the tap dancing was indicative of Kendrick gaslighting and avoiding the true conversation, while on disc two, it shows he's actively working to actually fix his problems. Now that he's grown through these situations and he has the gift, or I guess curse on this track, of hindsight, 
He confronts Miss Regret on the outro. He believes that Miss Regret is the curse that has kept him from being who he's called to be, and the obstacle he has to overcome throughout this disc. And while all of this reigns true in context with just the lyrics themselves, I don't think we get a full understanding of this song or Kendrick's mind state until we see the music video. Spiritual motifs are common in almost all of Kendrick's discography, which I've always felt was a great personal touch because Kendrick's a spiritual guy. As a person who's lame enough to study theology in his free time for fun, I can tell you that Kendrick's biblical messages are, to say the least, flawed most of the time, but he's always gotten the number one thing right, and that's trying to live the way that he believes God called him to live. On Count Me Out, the vocal sample that loops throughout the song says, I'm tripping and falling which seems rather arbitrary inside of the song itself, but the conversation Kendrick lets us see between himself and his therapist tells us a different story. You texted me at two o'clock in the morning. I feel like I'm fallen. Why do you feel that way? It's easy to just assume that this only illustrates Kendrick's brokenness, but the word fallen is just too specific to be that broad, and it's usually used to illustrate something that has fallen from grace, like a fallen kingdom or a fallen angel. Life. The imagery that Kendrick uses to illustrate life being what has made him fall tells us exactly what Miss Regret has been whispering in his ear. He was an angel destined for greatness born with the potential to change the world, and because of all the reasons he described on disc one, he fell from grace and is now just a broken man. You can see this remorse, the shame, the self-loathing on his face as he runs through all these events in his life that have caused his fall from grace, and it all builds to this moment where he has an epiphany that he has completely fallen short of the expectations that the young angel had for his older self. But this parallel towards this younger Kendrick goes a lot deeper than just this moment. It's not the first time he's rapped about him in a song, and the first time that he did, he made a promise that Miss Regret is reminding him of in this very moment. Oh, Mama is arguably the most pivotal moment in To Pimp a Butterfly. It's a bone-chilling discovery of what humility is and the ability to truly grow, which is indicative by the fact that the song draws parallels to every other era of Kendrick's career. But I want to focus specifically on verse 3 where Kendrick inside of the To Pimp a Butterfly narrative is returning home seeking answers, but all he finds is a little boy. Yet the further the verse goes on, the more apparent it is that the song is an allegory for encountering his own ideals and his innocent mindset before his hands got dirty in his fame. And this is all visualized through a conversation with his younger self. And the dialogue that takes place here is heartbreaking. It's confrontational, it's an assault on Kendrick's character and his intentions as an artist. As he spectates the boy and learns about his surroundings in everyday life, he catches Kendrick and reminds him that they're actually the same. What follows directly after is the boy peppering Kendrick with sarcasm, citing don't kill my vibe to call him a hypocrite, and then he proceeds to explain why he's not making a positive change to the community he came from regardless of what he tells us. And this entire devastating proclamation is summed up in just two lines that say, take a glimpse of your family ancestors and make a new list of everything you thought was progress, that's bull. The boy ends the conversation by pleading to Kendrick to stop convincing himself he's somebody he's not, and that if he actually wants to be an advocate, he can enlighten him. Kendrick accepts his offer, and the existential crisis that follows is my favorite moment in any Kendrick Lamar song ever. Kendrick's younger self reveals to him that in order to be his advocate, he needs to find the key to love. 
the panic attack that follows is Kendrick's epiphany that he has no idea how to get there. And now, if we shift our perspective back to Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, this adds a lot of necessary context to this project. Disc 1 ended on a high note with Purple Hearts, where Kendrick preached to us that love will ultimately be the answer to the struggle he's dealing with. The emotional breakdown on Count Me Out directly after comes from Kendrick remembering this conversation from Mama with his younger self as he realizes that after all this time, he still can't be his advocate. Despite the promise he made in 2015, he hasn't found love, and thus he feels like he's fallen. And so now, the question Kendrick is trying to answer on this disc has just become much simpler. What is keeping me from discovering the key to love? But in order to go through that journey, he's going to need forgiveness and support from the person he's transgressed against the most, himself. In a shocking but cathartic and comforting plot twist, Kendrick turns away from his therapist and retreats back into his mind as he searches for answers, yearns for peace, but finally, he has the help of the one he's trying to advocate for. And from this track, it seems like Kendrick has forgiven himself, but that's only half of the equation. It's not just himself, there's millions of others relying on him to be somebody that he's not. What about them? I'm sick of smiling at people when I feel dead inside. I'm sick of being nice to people who turn around and hurt me. I'm sick of being disciplined when everyone else does what they want. I'm so done with everything. But that's what I chose. Heavy is the head that chose to wear the crown. I can't please everybody. No, I can't please everybody. Crown is a gut-wrenching continuation of the character arc we started in Count Me Out and it reveals just how deeply confused and conflicted Kendrick is, and his utter misunderstanding of what he's actually searching for, that being love. Despite his efforts throughout his entire career to find love, this track serves to tell us as an audience just how tragically misinformed Kendrick's perception of love is. The song is similar to Worldwide Steppers on disc 1 in that it is muddy and claustrophobic. I feel like it's trying to articulate just how unclear Kendrick's mind state is in this moment. In verses 1 and 2, Kendrick is giving a detailed description of what he believes love is. Verse 1 is an anecdote of self-sacrifice and putting others before yourself while the latter is a description of fans offering positive feedback to the music he's released. Now I don't think I have to take time to explain why both of these perspectives are, to put it plainly, naive, especially since Kendrick seems to show how self-aware he is on the pre-chorus, where he takes this love and shows just how inauthentic it really is. Kendrick comes to the realization that no matter what he does, all of the people that love him will eventually just turn around and hate him again. This throws him into this panic state of hysteria where he's just repeating to himself over and over again, I can't please everybody. And really it's just this appalling show of anguish and stress. You're pretty much seeing a man realize that everything he's been working for in his adult life has been meaningless. And I think that to an extent we can all relate to that feeling. One of my favorite lines of all time from a Shakespeare play is interpolated here by Kendrick, which also references the Bible and the song's title. It's still unclear exactly what the crown imagery exactly represents, but we know that Kendrick is the one wearing it. And this calamity makes Kendrick retreat to find a place of solitude to protect his soul in the Valley of Silence. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this video and I want to interject quickly just to tell you guys that I really love doing this and I hope that you're enjoying my content at least a little bit. And if you are, it would really help this channel out if you would like or subscribe. I've noticed that the only videos that actually get picked up by the YouTube algorithm and get attention are the ones where you guys click the like button when you first watch it. So that's the main key to improving my channel and growing it. So if you guys are enjoying, that is the number one way 
to help me out. And also, I know you guys have seen the YouTubers who say, well, only a certain percent of these people who watch my videos are subscribed. But I actually went and I looked at the statistics for my channel the other day and 95% of my watch time are from people who aren't subscribed to my channel. And that number is really low. So bottom line is like and subscribe. If you don't want to do it for anything else, do it for me. I appreciate it. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Push these niggas off me like who? Push these bitches off me like who? Push these niggas off me like who? Silent Hill is probably my least favorite song on this project, which I think is consequence of its boring trap beat and its lack of substance lyrically, but I do like a lot of the ethereal melodies and Kendrick's flow in the song. With that said, I think it's better to view this song holistically and where it fits inside of the album's meta narrative rather than what's going on inside of the song itself. It seems that Silent Hill is almost meant to mirror Rich Spirit seeing as both of the songs illustrate themes of self-pronounced isolation and avoiding fake people. And this may be a coincidence, but if you put the tracklist of disc 1 backwards, all of the songs line up both sequentially and thematically, including Silent Hill and Rich Spirit. But we'll talk more about that later. And as Kendrick enters this place of solitude, he brings one person with him. And that's... Kodak Black? He's on this project again? I don't get this, Kendrick, don't you dare defend this man, he shouldn't be- the interlude that precedes the centerpiece of this side of the album contains one of Baby Keem's most impassioned performances on a microphone to date, and he's backed by these marching cinematic string sections that make this feel like a monologue in a movie. The song opens up with a vocal excerpt from Eckhart, who is Kendrick's therapist, and he's gonna show up a couple more times on this project. His contributions are usually meant to foreshadow the content of the songs he shows up in, but his inclusion itself seems representative of Kendrick finally opening up to changing and actively trying to find a solution, which he's realized won't come from himself. In this one verse, Keem paints a strikingly vivid and dark picture of what life was like for him and Kendrick growing up, which gives a lot of insight not just to their relationship, but the systemic problems and tribulations of everyday life that people are relying on Kendrick and Keem to stop from happening. He details watching his parents succumb to drug addiction, burying his family members, having to kill or be killed, and it's all horrifying. And it's all something they're asking Kendrick to fix. Just like younger Kendrick. And he failed that boy, which tells us that this song is a realization that he failed all those other people too. Imagine that. These people that you grew up with, and they struggled, and they wanted better for themselves, but they couldn't ever get there. So when you're the lucky one and you make it, you tell yourself, I'll never let those people go through that. I'll use my newfound fame to fix it, and I'll make everything better because nobody deserves that. But it's not that easy. Kendrick can't do all that. He's just one man, just a rapper. Not anything more. He's not our savior no matter how much we want him to be. Mr. Morrell, give me high five. Two times in the code of finish, judging my life. Back peddler, what they say you do to cha cha. In arguably the most pivotal moment in Kendrick's entire discography thus far, he essentially backtracks on everything he's stood for for almost a decade now. All the social issues, the commentary, the discussion he's created with his music, it all seems to be worthless to him. Savior is one of the most bitter songs that he's made. There's no gaslighting here, there's no artistic statement that he's making with this dark tone, he's just telling it how it is. Kendrick opens up the track by citing black musicians and athletes who are often looked up to, and concludes that they're simply human as well. As the beat breaks into this wicked shuffling drum loop and throbbing synthesizers, the first verse touches on the Black Lives Matter movement and his frustration that came from being called out by No Name for not publicly weighing in on the matter. Kendrick defends himself by pointing out that he was quote unquote meditating in silence, which apparently isn't allowed for someone like him. This fits into the overarching narrative by pointing out that this expectation was placed on Kendrick because people view him as a type of savior, not another person. Kendrick responds to this notion on verse 3 which is a rare moment where he genuinely lashes out on the listener, 
but frankly, I think it's earned. The cat is out the bag, I am not your savior. I find it just as difficult to love thy neighbors, especially when people got ambiguous favors, but they hearts not in it, see everything's for the paper. The struggle of the song ultimately comes down to the dichotomy between wanting to leave a positive impact on the world, one of Kendrick's most recurring goals, while also recognizing harsh reality and seeing through smoke and mirrors. Despite his desire to help others and be the messiah that he's been treated as, Kendrick has realized the brokenness of this world is not something that he can fix. He's no longer going to save face for the greater good because it's all futile anyway. So what he's done is, well, go to Silent Hill. Or as he says it, protect his soul in the Valley of Silence. So where does that leave the relationship between Kendrick and his fans? Beach, are you happy for me? Millie, are you happy for me? Smile on my face, but are you happy for me? Yeah, I'm out the way. Are you happy for me? In a moment that shows this incredible intuitiveness and foresight, Kendrick and Keem ask us as listeners if we're happy for them. Are we glad that they changed our expectations in order to save their own souls? Do we respect their decision even if it means we might not get everything we want from them? And that's a question that as a fan is hard to answer but it's not one that Kendrick hasn't asked before. In another parallel to To Pimp a Butterfly, he's revisiting a topic that has been better put before on a song that took place before he ever was a savior. Because all this time, despite what we think of him, he's always been a mortal man. I felt that pressure in Compton looking at the responsibility I have over these kids. The world started turning into a place where, where so many were getting no justice. You gotta step up to the plate. Mortal Man is not me saying, I can be your hero. Mortal Man is me questioning, do you really believe in me to do this? This track is the closer to the theatrical and dramatic narrative of growth and discovering self-worth that Kendrick presented with To Bimba Butterfly. It's a proclamation, a graceful acceptance of his prophet status as he closes the album by conversing with none other than Tupac about relevant issues that Kendrick seeks to revise. And that's exactly what this song is, a prophecy. The refrain asks a simple question that seems to predict exactly what Kendrick would be facing on Mr. Morale. Uh, when shit hit the fan, you still a fan. This track feels like it was released so long ago, and yet it's more relevant than ever. Despite Kendrick challenging his audience and leaving them with Mortal Man to reflect on for years, he's still accused of falling short and treated like a failure. And so on Savior, Kendrick steps away. He knows how the story's gonna end. We say we need leaders and then we leave him for dead. So he's getting out while he still can. Because he's not our savior. But Kendrick, you're the only hip hop artist with the answers. You are the savior. What are you doing? Please stop acting this way. You're our only ho- If the world can break even you, what hope is there for the rest of us? Tupac dead, gotta think for yourself. In a full circle moment on this song, Kendrick recalls the conversation that he had with Tupac at the end of To Pimp a Butterfly, and he's realizing this flaw in the call that he put on our hearts with that project. We don't need someone to lead us out of oppression, to lead us out of struggle, we need ourselves. And just to rub salt in that wound, Kendrick's gonna show us just how unworthy he really is. My auntie is a man now, I think I'm old enough to understand now. There are a lot of bold moments on this project, and so many points that were huge risks for Kendrick in their own way, but I think Auntie Diaries is the biggest risk he has ever taken in terms of social commentary. I mean, think about it, we know how Kendrick grew up and where he grew up, but most importantly, the genre of music that he resides in. Homophobia and transphobia are terrible issues that have plagued hip hop for years, but most artists would get crushed from the backlash of trying to stand up to it. And I think the sound and the way Kendrick delivers this track show how aware he is of that. The track is eerie and kind of supernatural, as this pulsing loop of soft percussions work in tandem with these spaceship sounding synthesizers, as if the production is trying to create this illustration of an abstract thought board. And Kendrick's rapping is hushed. 
his voice has this in your ear feel to it, like he's too scared to say any of this out loud. The story presented within the song illustrates Kendrick's experience with his transgender aunt and cousin, and how he's never intentionally been homophobic because of the influence they've had on his life, but that's where the controversy comes in. Back when it was comedic relief to say faggot, 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 we ain't know no better. Elementary kids with no filter, however. To illustrate his point, Kendrick uses a slur throughout the song to describe his flawed attitude and ignorance as he was growing up, which he's using to tell us not to be like him. When he was young, he used to think it was just a word and nothing more. But all of this sets up the contradiction at the end of the song, which Kendrick uses to show us just how much of a hypocrite he truly is. See, if words are just a sound, what about this? You say Kendrick ain't no room for contradiction To truly understand love, switch position Faggot, 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 we can say it together But only if you let a white girl say nigga How could we ever think so highly of him? He's a hypocrite, he's a liar, he's judgmental and- But how can that be? Kendrick is such a graceful guy, I don't get it. Where did he learn all of this? At this point in the project, it feels like a spaceship that's lost control and is spiraling into a crash landing. After learning some frustrating truths about Kendrick and his psyche, Mr. Morale introduces us to an explanation as for how everything got this way. Because these problems don't just come down to him, they're generational. The song is one of the most sonically ambitious on the project, with its devastating drums and harrowing vocal sample that's just distorted into the void. This track sounds like what Yeeza should have been if it was a lot better. On this track, Kendrick is addressing people that he knows and public figures, and lamenting on their trauma and how hard it must be to live through it. But at the end of verse 2 is where we finally start to see a breakthrough. Past life regressions to know my conditions is based off experience. Karma for karma, my habits insensitive. Kendrick opens us up to this theory that his shortcomings are karma for other people's past lives, which is to say that this is a snowball effect he's caught up in, started by those who came before, and he concludes by saying that he's going to sacrifice himself in order to stop this. And that brings us to. Oh man. We have never heard Kendrick rap like this. He's not using his normal voice, he's not using his classic hysterical voice that we heard on songs like You and Mona Lisa, and he's not whispering like he was on Auntie Diaries. His voice has a slight rasp, he speaks in a low tone like he's recounting memories that cut to the very core of his deepest, darkest secrets. It all just results in a Kendrick that comes off defeated. And what's funny about this is that the subject matter, the meta-narrative of this album has illustrated that to us over and over again, but actually hearing Kendrick sound like this is... Ugh. Kendrick opens up the song with a recap of all the factors that have built up this tension he's felt throughout the entire project, which comes to a head here. With the opening bars, I'm sensitive, I feel everybody, one man standing on two words, heal everybody, reminds us that the number one thing keeping him from honesty for all of these years has been his savior complex. But now, once and for all, he's breaking through that. He continues on by explaining that his mother was sexually abused in front of him when he was five, an event that would shape him for years to come, and he's felt this grief for her and his grandmother ever since, which he distracted himself from by, in his words, buying a Range Rover. The ending line, you haven't felt grief until you felt it sober, ties the entire concept together and calls back to almost every motif on the entire project. United in Grief was cryptic, but going back, it introduced us to all of these themes. Kendrick distracting himself with materialism, his struggle to cope with sexual trauma. He's not a drug addict, 
but he's definitely not sober. In verse 2, Kendrick explains how he was traumatized by the constant assumption that his own family members would assault him, a notion that his mother could never seem to shake. Once he became famous, he still can't get over this and the trauma he watched his mother endure, which sets us up for the gut punch in verse 3. He starts to gaslight us once more at first, explaining that he has never been high or drunk, and that he worked through his emotions sober, but there's something else, a different form of pleasure that's potentially more powerful than drugs. And Kendrick has tried hard to avoid being honest about this throughout the entire project. I did it sober, sitting with myself. I went through all emotions, no dependence, except for one. Let me bring you closer, intoxicated. There's a lustful nature that I failed to mention. Insecurities that I project sleeping with other women. Kendrick Lamar, a prophet, so-called savior of hip-hop, one of the most profound writers of this generation, and an adulterer. This entire album, this song, it's all context for Kendrick's guilt, his pain, his sorrow, and that he's played right into this generational trauma he's put everything into trying to fix. He's realized he can't save everyone. He can't even save himself. So now, after finally laying it all out there, he does the only thing he can. Kendrick has sacrificed himself, his reputation, everything he's built up, so that we can have transformation. And then finally, in a full circle moment of catharsis and cinematic closure, this vocal passage sets up the final song. I bear my soul and now we're free. Kendrick has shown us throughout this entire project just how unworthy he is. But in doing so, he's given all of us the key to growing past his shortcomings, being better than he was. But with all those pieces, the only thing Kendrick has left to do on this project is assemble the key to love. The pressure's taking over me, it's beginning to loom. Better if I spare your feelings and tell you the truth. This final track is just as satisfying and comforting as it is soul crushing. We're essentially watching a man give up. The pressure's too much, he can't take this expectation anymore, he's out of options. So he just absolves himself completely. In verse 3, Kendrick confronts the toxicity of his savior complex, using the mirror concept as a vessel to put listeners on the hot seat. My favorite lines from this verse are when he writes personal gain off my pain it's nonsense, darling my demons are off the leash for a mosh pit, which is a salient illustration of his pain often being overlooked in his music for the aesthetic appeal, which is to say Kendrick feels like there's no point since his message will go over people's heads anyway. But the bridge on this song ties up the final thread of Kendrick's character arc on the track, as he realizes that true love is unconditional. It's not the toxic infatuation he described in Crown, or the commitment he's made to the public that he described on Savior. It's something that he'll never actually get from his audience. And so Kendrick, in a true drop the mic moment, closes off the album with this. Sorry I didn't save the world, my friend. I was too busy building mine again. He's free. He did it. Thank goodness. And so we're done now, right? Narrative is over? I choose me. Wait. Wait. Did we seriously not talk about this guy yet? Huh. Well, I'll be back next week. As I get a little older, I realize life is perspective. And my perspective may differ from yours. I want to say thank you to everyone that's been down with